So, well, we're all about the audience. So, uh, please uh, feel free to uh, think about your questions and interact with us. And uh, I think Michael and I's personalities are both, uh, we like informality uh, and having some, some fun. Uh, my name is Ted Ayers, and uh, I'm a book reader and a beer drinker. Uh, I uh, write a monthly book review for the Active Age and also host of a little filler TV show on PBS Kansas about books. And uh, I've had the pleasure of meeting Michael, and we've had this conversation a couple of times. And I always learn something new uh, and something wonderful. And so I'm going to introduce Michael to you, then we'll get into our questions. And tonight's book, as you know, is Celebrating Kansas Breweries by Michael J. Travis. Michael is a graduate of the University of New Hampshire. He worked in corporate retail for years, spending the bulk of his career with Payless Shoe Source in Topeka. The pandemic forced him to redefine his professional career after losing a position in the first year that COVID struck. He established a retail consulting company catering to small businesses, which gave him the time and opportunity to follow up on an early writing experience, his spiral-bound journey capturing a 1972 family summer trip in a blue Volkswagen van to the West Coast and back. Michael Travis is a man who appreciates his family. He's a social man who enjoys people and conversation, a fellow who likes beer, and a man who is enthusiastic about Kansas and particularly optimistic about the future of the state and the many small towns spread across our 105 counties where craft breweries have been established. So with that introduction, we'll get started. And Michael? I hope I don't disappoint after that. It's like, who is this guy he's talking about? But anyways, uh, thank you for coming. Obviously, I referenced uh, your 1972 family vacation. Tell us about that trip and how it, well, let me, let me ask. Tell us about that tra trip and did it lay a foundation for this book? You know, it's funny because you say vacation and, you know, here my two brothers and sister, you know, are bebopping in the driveway, getting ready to jump into the, the VW bus. You know, we're getting out of school early. My dad's taking 45 days off and we're driving from Massachusetts to the West Coast and back. And I distinctly remember as we're getting into our assigned seats, my older brother, did, um, my mom handed us school journals, blank school journals. And she said to each of us as she handed them out, you know, you've got some homework on this trip. And your homework is however you define journal, I want you to write about what you do every day. And I fell in love with road trips, despite, you know, watching my dad have many car issues, you know, from from uh, Massachusetts out west and back in that VW bus, um, you know, <laughs> running away from tornadoes in the Midwest that we had never seen growing up in New Hampshire. Um, some days I might have documented simply, you know, my dad drove 1200 miles and we had I had three cheeseburgers at McDonald's. <laughs> but then there were days where, you know. We had magical uh, memories, you know, for me, I grew up playing baseball. So one of the first stops was Cooperstown, New York, you know, which the, bro the brothers influenced and said, we have to go to the baseball. Okay. But I found, um, you know, one, I really fell in love with just watching the road go by, you know, even at that age and, you know, seeing the country. Um, and I still have the journal, all the kids, we still have our journals. And it's really interesting kind of going back you know, what was important to me back then was, you know, writing in my pencil what was happening during the day, um, observations of brothers and sisters perhaps misbehaving. And um, at one point, my mom getting fired from the front seat because she wasn't reading the map well. And thank God <laughs> my dad didn't call me up. He called the older brother. Um, but, you know, I, I fell in love with just that whole environment, you know, kind of writing uh, about my experiences at age nine going on 10. So you can imagine, you know, the content. Um, and it did, you know, I, I I grew up in a family as we all evolved and matured. I've got an older brother who is a uh, writer and published. Um, he's a historian. 
I've got a younger brother out in Seattle that started taking up poetry as a way to kind of navigate his life and his journey. Um, so I watched those two and my mother, you know, who gifted us with that homework assignment, um, um, really tried to put together kind of a memoir because she had a very interesting and at times um, really arduous life journey. Um, and, you know, Ted mentioned, um, I can distinctly remember a day in March of or actually May of excuse me, 2020, when we were working remotely, you know, and all of a sudden got a call from my boss, who I got along great with and still do. And I, my position and my team were eliminated. And, um, you know, from that point, God bless a wife that's been with me for a long time. You know, she rallied around me and said, well, you've got to earn some money. And um, I was earning money, but more on a part-time basis and um was very restless and she said maybe now's the time maybe this is a you know a kind of a call to action um and my wife and i love breweries we live in lawrence i think wichita is the best beer scene in the state i will say that although i am a lawrence resident um but we love the the environment you know, I do like a good beer, but we love and just we love going and sitting and feeling like an extension of the family um, and spending a couple hours. Um, and I also love people. And, you know, I quickly kind of navigated where I wanted to go and said, I think there's a book to write, you know. And there was. Yeah, there was. Uh, yes. And Michael, it just occurred to me, we haven't talked about this before, but this assignment from your mother was was that a surprise to you or was this something your mom no. was, would uh it was a surprise i mean when we saw you know we all were kids at one point in time and i think a lot of us ran the other way when perhaps mom was buying school supplies like no summer can't be over so i distinctly remember and i still have that three ring notebook you know the yellow cover and the line pages and and uh was kind of hard pressed at first a little speechless at the assignment well, it's just one of those things that we take for granted or really don't think about how that parental influence can really change or so strongly influence your life along the way. Absolutely. And you know, this opportunity to have this notebook clearly paid, paid dividends for you. Mm -hmm. Michael, you put 6,000 miles on your Honda Pilot and you traveled for 28 consecutive weeks visiting 59 breweries in 37 cities and communities. Tell us, was it worth it? Absolutely. I I fell in love. I am, you know, uh, I was born in Massachusetts, spent my secondary school time in New Hampshire, where my parents were from. My wife and I have raised two daughters in the Midwest. And, you know, Ted has heard me say this. I probably say I'm a Kansan. I love the Midwest. I think the people are the best in the country. And I honestly didn't know the state of Kansas well. As I started driving, you know, and you can imagine living in Lawrence, my first plan of action was go west, start as far away as the breweries are and work my way back. But Ted, I, you know, I, every time I was out, including today, driving down from Lawrence, you know, um, I, you know, landscape, people, you know, I, I fell in love um, over and over again, you know, as I got behind the car and, and drove those 6,000 miles. In many cases, um, you'll you'll hear from me. I mean, it really the book is about the people that I met along the way. And there were many times where my wife would look at me as I said, I'm going back to Hayes. You know, and that's not a short journey from Lawrence, but I became friends, you know, with owners and brewers. And and there were many times where I went back. You know, it might have been that I met with brewery owners that were building a brewery, you know, and I saw the empty shell of an old, old building, you know, as they kind of looked up and went, what have we done? And then I had the chance to go back and see the finished product. So I, I did a lot of rebound travel. Well, to me, it's one of the great things about this book because it is about Kansas. It is about people. And of course, it's about a brewing industry, which is so impactful these days. Uh, and, and the book is just a joy to read. If you haven't read it yet, I really encourage you to do that. And let's just talk about it, Michael. What has been the response to the book for you? 
and you know, I've done um Ted's been along the journey a couple of times with me. So, you know, I can even update you further. So I think at this stage in the game, the book was published on August 15th. And, you know, that first week I hit three breweries, you know, in my backyard. So I had kind of a, you know, a party, so to speak, at Fields and Ivy Brewery in Lawrence. And then went to the Lawrence Public Library and had a great talk and shared the stage with a brewer and talked about, you know, it was just a, it was a great partnership. But I, I have done... Um, 33 book signings. This is now my ninth talk. I've been on two radio shows. I've been on a podcast under the lid. Now there's a PBS show that's going to be coming out, you know, so the, the journey has been amazing. Um, you know, and, um, it's been everything. It's been everything and more, you know, I think what it, you know, I, I didn't write a masterpiece, you know, I, I love masterpieces, but this was something that was a passion project for me. And I've uh, found so much reward in moments, you know, like I was in Phillipsburg right before Christmas, seeing Stephanie and Matt at Oz Brewing. And their son came up to me and said, you wouldn't believe the number of people that are coming in with your book, because I'll say this in talks. And they're coming in with your book and they're asking my dad and mom to sign it. And, you know, that's what I've encouraged when I've had conversations. It's like, if you walk into a brewery, ask if the brewer's there, you know, and if if they are and they have a moment to sit with you, that moment's going to become an hour of, you know, having a beer together and he or she talking about what he or she poured into making that beer. So, um, you know, I've, I've had a lot of kind of magic moments like that. Um, I had an individual, I, I did a... Uh, signing with my youngest daughter at the beer fest at Wichita Brewing Company in early January. It was an event they had. And my daughter, who's a teacher, noticed this individual come in and I was signing a book. It was antsy, but smiling. And I could hear her say, you know, um, can I help you? And he's like, I, I, I've, I've been so excited to meet your dad. And he finally got up and he's, you know, I think he was, he was a surgeon and he said, um, look at this book. And he bought a book written in 2017 called Kansas Beer by Bob Crutchfield. And he had traveled with that book to every brewery. So he said, I've gone to every brewery in the state and it was dog-eared and he had done the same thing. It was signed, you know, it was, it, it was worn, but happily worn. He said, now I want to buy your book and I'm going to start the journey. Again. <laughs> so, you know, those moments, you know, it, you know, have been incredible for me. Well, as they say, priceless. Yeah, they have been. Yeah, yeah. Your first chapter, Michael, uh, I think it's called Brew Like an Egyptian, deals with the Topeka Brewer's search for ancient recipes. Why did you start your book with that story? Um, I was, so if you, you know, if you have the book or you buy the book, there's a mugshot of Adam Rossdale, who's co-owner and head brewer at Norseman Brewery in Topeka. And he's a classic brewer. He's got, you know, in this case, he's got a mohawk. He's got the long beard, you know, which is embodies a lot of our brewers across the state. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it, it's a classic example of don't judge a book by its cover. This guy is beyond me as far as intelligence. And I was sitting with he and his co-owner just talking about what they've done, which is typically how I would do it. I didn't go in. I would do some homework and look at their social media and kind of get a sense of their rhythm and what was important to them. So I come in feeling like I knew them a little bit, um, but I would just let the conversation go where, you know, they wanted it to go. And I would kind of go along for the journey and it could last an hour and a half to two hours. And as we were talking, he made a comment just on the side about he was pursuing this Egyptian recipe from 2,500 years ago and he was trying to replicate it, you know, to the T as much as he could. And I looked at him and, you know, when we were hitting it off and I'm like, Adam, there's a story to tell, you know, I'd like to come back and just sit and hear about that. And what I did in the book, unlike um, traditional beer books, I have profiles of the breweries, every brewery. So you, you know, you'll be able to read about every brewery from my perspective, but it's often me just carrying the words that were shared with me and letting them tell their story. But I also found stories like that, Ted, that all of a sudden became feature stories. So I've got feature stories setting up like a new chapter, you know, so the Wichita Way is the first chapter with the 13 breweries and Adam and Walk Like an Egyptian is the opening story. 
And it was like going into um, a rabbit hole with him. You know, I mean, he maniacal in the approach and the amount of reading and research he was doing. And he said to me, you know, which I think is classic for brewers. It really embodies, I think, the spirit they have, you know, like you. I mean, he he wanted to try something uncharted. He wanted to really challenge his brewing capabilities. He said to me, you know, I'm, I'm making 20 barrels. You know, I'm not making it in a small pilot. I'm making it in our brew house. I might not sell much. You know, and in fact, people might not understand this beer unless I go to every table and say, let me tell you about this beer. Um, Be but, like Sam's dad. <laughs> you know, but it was for him, it was really the journey. Yeah. It was kind of challenging, you know, what he knew. Um, and, uh, you know, I was captivated. So you'll see a mugshot jumping out yet at you with a smile. And that's the story of Brew Like an Egyptian. We're going to jump around a little bit, Michael. Uh, what you're talking about. Um, the various maps or diagrams you have. And uh, well, was one of the things I enjoyed was the itineraries where you suggest a variety of brewery tours across Kansas based really regionally. Was that intentional on your part or did it develop organically? You know, I I started, you know, my dad was an engineer and I fall, fell far from that tree, you know, and but I, you know, he would have been proud. And, looking down from up above as I tried to be engineer like with putting the book together. And I, you know, initially was like, okay, I'll put it in quadrants and this is what I'll do. You'll find if you, you know, if you look at the book that the, the chapters make sense, you know, the Wichita way I've done Wichita in that concentric circle, because there are just some great breweries around the radius of Wichita. Um, I live in Lawrence, you've got rock chalk to wildcat country. You know, just kind of running along I seventy and capturing all the breweries on that on that junket. Um, I knew I was going to do something. I felt I felt you know, and it, and it I've seen it happen, which has been great. That I wanted it to be a book that was interactive. I was hoping that it would be a book that I have a lot of beer books, and I was hoping it would be a book that people would go back to, you know, or maybe even just throw in the car down in the you know sleep by their door as something that they could reference. Uh, so I, I evolved that way. Yeah. Um, uh, in the book, you uh, wrote that, uh, writing the book came with some roadblocks, including a herniated disc injury. Uh, was that suffered on the road or how did that occur? Road probably compounded it. I had back surgery 12 years ago successfully, but, um, Yes, I, I, I think I exacerbated it doing something foolish at home, you know, and all of a sudden was sidelined. Um, and it, it took me out of, out of the journey for two and a half weeks. Um, I did run into other roadblocks. You know, it was funny. I, Southeastern Kansas, I was infatuated by the phenomenon of the number of, um, armadillos I was seeing that were roadkill, you know, so I was actually at some point in all those journeys counting the number I was seeing, you know, feeling bad for everyone, but it's like, where are these all coming from? Um, Texas. Yes. <laughs> Looking for food. I know. I um, gracefully um, said hi to a buck one night um, driving to my Airbnb, and I say gracefully because he came up on my side on a very small state highway, as we all know, and there's no margin for error, or nowhere to go. And fortunately, we were moving, you know, in sync. So he left the road on his four feet. Um, I stopped further down the road. And I mean, it was shocking, not a dent in the car. But I, I did, you know, whether it was, a, you know, a flat tire where I fell in love with a you know, a gentleman in a small town who, you know, had a car shop you know, that he'd had for his entire life. He was so happy to plug my tire and I was his disciple. I'm like, show me how you do this. I've never seen this. <laughs> um, yeah, but I did have the roadblocks, but I, you know, I um, just kept reconnecting. The The funniest thing, Ted, was I had this vision. I started in June of 2021 hitting the brewery's way out us. And I was doing consulting. So I would tend to do my brewery travel around the hours they had, because think about it, it was still pandemic time. Um, and it usually was later in the week because, you know, they'd be on site. Um, um, 
But I had this cookie cutter engineering thought process where I'll get it done by the end of August, all 59 breweries. I don't know what I was thinking. You know, it was February of 2022 when I finally wound down the travel. But I learned quickly, Ted, that, you know, I, I wasn't process driven. But the fir- from the first brewery to the last, the minute, you know, we sat down, I'd have a recorder. They'd know it. I'd put it on the table. But you get these artists talking and they want to talk. You know, if they can finally take a moment, take their boots off, you know, put the hose down and talk about what they do, whether they, in, in many cases, they were owners and brewers. So they're trying to, you know, run the financial aspect of the business while creating some really good beer. Any traffic tickets? No traffic tickets. There you go. <laughs> uh, well, you know that I don't know. <laughs> yep, no uh, traffic tickets. Let's follow up on uh, the what I think, what I know is the massive amount of information that you've gathered. What was the hardest part of writing a book and trying to determine what stories you were going to tell? You know, it, it was funny because my, my brother's a historian, so he's written about Civil War. You know, so he's gone back into journals, but he's 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 brought people that have passed back to life in, on his pages. And, you know, he's been my coach and mentor at times. And he said to me, I had I had 180 hours of tape um, and I left most of the writing until I was done with the travel. So here I'm finally sitting down at the desk and I'm like, I've got a lot of audio to listen to. And my brother kept saying, send it out, get it transcribed. And I'm like. You know, I got into debate and I didn't do that because I felt the minute I put a tape on that might have been six months old, I could see myself at the table. I could see the expressions. I could hear the inflection. Um, So, you know, that to me was the daunting task was listening. But I literally, you know, there, there are things I try to talk about within every brewery, but they might not be in the same order because I would let the conversation kind of guide and I would look for those nuggets, whether it was a classic quote, you know, some of these guys and gals are, you know, they are a joy to listen to or, you know, things that were important to them. Um, I would just kind of sit with a pad of paper and start jotting down kind of headlines and then mix and match. And um, that to me was fun because you would think writing about 59 breweries could be repetitive. But the beauty was, although they all kind of have an underlying theme of why they're doing what they're doing, their stories are so different. Um, and that to me made it, e- it made it easier. There were moments where I'm like, oh, my God, I'm slogging through this hour and a half. And maybe this brewer is not as interesting or maybe I'm not fun to listen to. And I'm like, oh, my God, you know, <laughs> that's, that's yeah. a tough part. Yes. You're right, Michael, that your goal was to write a feature focused on how each of us can enjoy our brewery visits with a greater understanding of what is happening in the brew house. Why was that important to you? You know, it was funny because I thought it was really important. There's a there's a feature story called Brewery 101. And I sat with a head brewer um, who's, um, you know, started brewing in a Um, commercial brew house in Chicago, came down to Lawrence. Um, He shared the stage the second night with me. Um, And he was, you know, I suggested to him, why don't we connect? And I would love to have you help me tell a story for someone that's never walked into a craft brewery. You know, what's behind that glass? You know, that glass, what am I looking at? Um, How do I approach it? And it was really funny because I did write it, but it went from I didn't think it was going to be scientific at all, but, you know, I thought it was going to be kind of rigid, you know, A, B, C, D, but Sam looked at me and said, you know, it, it's not a big deal. You know, brew house, you know, cone vessels this way, he kind of, you know, he very simply in layman's terms, you know, broke down his brewery and he's got a big brewery, Lawrence Beer Company in, in Lawrence. Um but, you know, his attitude was if I'm sitting at the bar meeting folks that are coming in to have a good beer, you know, what kind of taste do you like? He he often will open up and say, what's in your fridge? You know, what type of juices do you have? You know, what type of food do you like? And he'll start on a, a avenue that doesn't even include beer. And suddenly he's connecting and putting a beer in front of that individual that either is going to test 
you know, their taste. But, you know, Ted, it became more like a, just a real approachable way to kind of walk in and have a great experience. Yeah. Marcy Penner of the Kansas Sampler Foundation, an, an author herself, is quoted in your book as saying, your book could be a conduit to bring people together. Do you agree with uh, Marcy's statement? You know, I, I was fortunate to go to her summit, the 2022 summit, and play a role. Um, you know, her whole focus with that foundation is really on rural Kansas, you know, and, and um, I fell in love and there's a chapter called it's a small town sticking around one of the things that really struck me was finding these small towns where breweries six breweries opened last year in towns of under 2500 people mm -hmm. and they're difference makers and you know that led me to having a lot of conversations with marcy um and so yeah i i think you know marcy's pledge and commitment from her nonprofit. um ties really closely Ted to you know something that became very important kind of hit me between the eyes as far as probably the most compelling story that I ran into that should be heartwarming for us Kansans um because I I think it bodes well you know well, for, let's, for small communities did I just give you a lead and the next question and, uh, <laughs> so segue into uh we rehearse all night yeah. <laughs> uh, in your travels, you visited such Kansas towns as Cortland, Holton, Humboldt, Minneapolis, Phillipsburg, and Sylvan Grove, population 257, the smallest town to have a neighborhood brewery. What do these communities have in common? You know, I, I so I, I felt the, the storyline was so cool because, you know, whether it was Oz Brewing in Phillipsburg, where Matt and husband grew up in and Phillipsburg blocks away from the building that they have their brewery in and he and his wife were living in Denver and wanted to come home or the two couples that opened up Riverbank and Council Grove and the two boys men went to high school there didn't really know each other but all of a sudden these two couples plus the fifth wheel you know decide to open a brewery in Council Grove what I found so heartwarming you know the couple in Cortland you know, a, a town of just under 300 people um, was the common thread was often someone in the group was coming home, you know, and either wanted just to come home because they valued what that town represented to them or they wanted to come back and or they came back um, because they wanted to make a difference. And, you know, and it sounds corny, but you know, often what I what what I, what I was witnessing was, um, you know, couples that in some cases are still working full time jobs, opening up breweries. It's kind of a bridge because they're just not sure, um, but they want to become a staple within the community. You know, you know, you don't often go into a brewery and see someone having had one too many. That's not a common occurrence. People are going, families, friends, and they're spending hours. And it's because it's a gathering spot, you know, and I, Council Grove's a great example. I fell in love with what was happening in that community because within that time period, they had a brewery opening up on the river, an independent bookstore, um, which brought us together, um, coffee shops. So, you know, you see these towns that are at different stages of, kind of going through a, a metamorphosis from the days gone by to kind of redefining who they are. But to me, it was so heartwarming. I mean, I was humbled every time I'd kind of walk away going, I'm just trying to write this book and these people are, you know, risking. Change your life. Yeah. Uh, but the, the, the great thing is um, I have seen whether it's, Phillipsburg, Minneapolis, Cortland, River, or, uh, Council Grove, Humboldt, Holton, um, the lion's share of the, the cities that are towns I just rattled off, brewers are either opening up second locations or they're expanding. But bottom line, the community has responded in such a way that, you know, you hear music playing, you know, I mean, it's not easy, but um, I'm seeing traction. And well, and it is bringing people together like Marcy. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned earlier in our discussion, Michael, about you know, your 
classic quotations or something to that effect. One I came across, I think it relates to our discussion right now, quote, rural matters, rural has value. Expand on that. In that conversation with that individual, uh, why did you pick up on that statement? And uh, so that individual um, had a full-time job before he and his wife decided to open a brewery in Cortland, and it was in economic development for the county. So, um, you know, what I keep running into is people that are pretty passionate about wanting to make a difference. And um, he, in this case, and he's not alone in the state, he's really proud of where he's from. You know, and it's a town of just under 300 people. Um, and he is so committed to the broader story. You know, his brewery can play a part, but he's so committed to you know, ultimately wanting to have a family grow up in Cortland, Kansas. And, um, you know, I, 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 it's, it's, you know, it's, you know, I'm seeing towns, excuse me, you know, Minneapolis is a great example where a doctor and, and dentist um, want to put a stake in the community and they opened up more than a brewery. They opened up a brewery that also has a coffee shop, has, uh, community center that is can be converted to a pickleball court. You know, they've created all kinds of events, including weddings, you know, within their facility. And, um, you know, I think rural matters, they they value the life that they're they're either reconnecting with or moving from a Denver to live. Um, and they want to play a part, you know, and I think, you know, be you know, become part of the fiber or the fabric of the community. And that to me has been, you know, uh, heartwarming you know, over and over again. Well, and going back to some of our earlier conversation where this really is a book about Kansas, Kansas, and we all know that there's much more rural in Kansas than there is urban. And this growth and this development, I think, does bode well for our state. You know, it's it's funny because no matter where you are, you know, almost in the country, that's the way it used to be. You know, every community or neighborhood, in some cases, had a had a uh, brewery. Um, and I don't, you know, we're never going to get to that point. But the the growth in Kansas has outpaced the national growth, which has been amazing. So in the last few years, we've been outpacing the national brewery growth, which has been, you know, um, it's one of the few industries you can look at in the U.S. where you see a trajectory that's you know moving like this uh, versus flatlining. And even in you know in the pandemic, I mean, I, I think of three young guys that were with Tallgrass. One was a football player for K State. They all went to K State. They lost their roles when Tallgrass went through oh, yeah. a really tough time, but they wanted to open a brewery in Manhattan. They opened their brewery and had a schedule right in the heart of the pandemic. But here they are with a finished brewery and they kind of looked around and said, we've just spent a lot of money. And you know what I also found like all retailers and all of us, you had to kind of redefine yourself when the pandemic hit. So they found, you know, I, they were one of many breweries that suddenly invested in canning lines, you know, Wichita um, stand, or Central Standard. You know, I remember the uh, their great group down there and they were talking about almost the morning they went through. I mean, they were wondering if they were going to survive, but they invested in the canning line quickly because they had a community that wanted to support them, keep them going. Um, yeah, so it's been very interesting. You uh, devote several pages, Michael, to female brewmasters. Uh, one of your uh, statements was diversity within our brewing community will continue to create variety, flavor, innovation, and discovery for craft beer fans. Tell us what unique perspective, in your opinion, do female brewmasters bring to the barrel? Well, first I'll say we don't have enough. You know, I, I was just out in Boston seeing family, and I was really happy to see in a great brewery called Jack Savvy, a female brewer in this huge brew house. And I'm like, yes. Um, but I'll, I'll kind of talk to Winfield. You know, if anybody's been down to Lady Bird Brewing in Winfield, um, a couple, um, um, uh, Katie from Winfield, and in fact, VP of Communications at Southwestern. And, 
you know, her spouse and attorney wanted to open up a brewery. Um, and it started with, you know, a passion for homebrewing. And all of a sudden they found that, you know, we're pretty good at this and we like having people gather at our home. Maybe we should scale it up. Um, but they've made a concerted effort and they have a beautiful old gas station that they opened this brewery and they've made a concerted effort that their business is woman owned, woman run. And, you know, I would tell you, um, they have, you know, I think I can think of 59 brewers and they all have different come from different backgrounds, different experiences, whether it's life, culinary, brewing, that it really kind of helped shape where they want to go. But I took my wife down there. We did a signing. Um, I've been down there twice on my own, brought my wife down because I couldn't wait to have her meet Katie and Laura. And I would tell you that they've created an environment that's unique. Um, um, warm in a different way, family in a different way. Um, and they also, you know, I think approach, I mean, brewing is brewing. I mean, you've got, you know, four central ingredients and you can do, you know, you can do some amazing things with what you're working with now, sunflower seeds like you're talking about. But um, I think they're pouring a different passion into what they're brewing. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of it is stemming from kind of the 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 road they want to take their brewery. So, for example, one of the things I thought was great when we were down there, they now have a young woman junior brewer who's commuting from Wichita every day. That's not a long drive, but she's driving from Wichita to Winfield. And they're grooming her, you know, um, to and, and she'll say, she said to me, I want to open up my own brewery. So, you know, I, I, I'd i say it's not as much uh, that they're bringing necessarily a, a plethora of completely different beer, um, but I think approach and uh, what they're trying to create within their brewery has, you know, it has its own personality. And they're not, you know, I, I think we're so far behind in our states. We've got a wonderful woman that makes, I'm not a sour fan. That's the one beer style that I really can't, you know, mesh with. My young daughters can. But Courtney Service owns a brewery called Service Brewing in Shawnee. And if you look at her beer board, 12 beers, eight of them typically are sours. And they're crazy flavors but she has made a name for herself. And she, she, in that case, you know, brewers are smart, you know, who's our audience and you know, what are they like? And I'm going to keep making it and oh, trying to stretch their boundaries. So um, I just think, you know, it, it, it's a, it's a business, it's an industry that's been so male dominated. Um, and it's so much fun to see. We need more diversity. And I hopefully I can follow up with a couple of related questions, but, uh, you made me want to ask, are there minority brewers in Kansas? Um, we have uh, one that I know of. Uh, you know, I, I met um, one of the principals behind Vine Street Brewing, which is not opening in Kansas, but it's opening down in the Vine Street Jazz District in KC, and it's Black-owned, and they're, they're doing incredible things, and they're opening in March, and they'll be the first in the state of Missouri. Is that just a Negro League, basically? Yes. Yes, and I can't that make is it out. Here. It is, um, you know, um, underpenetrated, underserved, you know. Um, and I see, I say in the book that I, you know, I challenge our state, you know, to, I challenge our brewing community, you know, to think beyond what's in their brew house, you know, and look for youngsters that that are coming from all kinds of backgrounds. Walnut River, very interestingly, down in El Dorado, great group of guys. And they're, I would say they're almost visionaries in some ways. They're toying with the idea of opening up a, a true brewing school in the state of Kansas. Mm -hmm. um, and that would be amazing because then all of a sudden there's a platform for youngsters. Doesn't mean need be youngsters, people that have a passion and want to kind of explore that opportunity. Um, you know, and, just, and I'm hopeful. Yeah, so much to talk about. I, <laughs> I think, if I recollect, in the introduction, I said that the book, there's 59 breweries. 
Has that number expanded? Are there more today? Yeah, it has. I, I've got actually a reporter from the Kansas City Star that is not writing a feature on me, but he's writing a feature and he reached out to me once to write a story about small town Kansas and you know the resurgence and what's happening. And I'm playing a part in it. And um, he asked if I could share some stats that I get through um, you know, national level beer stats. And um, right now in our state, unfortunately I've seen two breweries close, including one that has a feature. And I love the Gentle Giant. So uh, Center Pivot Restaurant Brewery Quinter, uh, Steve, um, six foot nine, tallest brewer in the state. Now I have to look for the next tallest. <laughs> but unfortunately, running a business while being a high school teacher was becoming too burdensome for him. And I think he'll be back in the industry at some point. But I've seen two close this year. But we're netting up right now. I think we're approaching 67. Um, and, you know, Derby. We had one open in Derby, First Man Brewery. Um, we've got one opening in Overland Park, Stockyard, which already has another location. But they're opening a much bigger brewing facility because they are going to be restaurant and brewery in the new KCI airport. And they're like, mm. we need to scale this up. Um, Baldwin, Baldwin Beer Company. Um, friction beer company. So um, transport's opening a second location down at Gardner. So there is a lot of positive happening in the state. But, you know, I thought about driving out. It, it's not any business is not for the faint of heart, you know. Oh, and, and it definitely is true when I see, you know, a, a couple couples making some tough decisions on closing the doors. You know, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but you know, just talking about the, the closures that you've mentioned and the new ones coming along, is a volume two out there of your book? Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, um, I would. It would. It would be fun. I think as I, I have, you know, I've got a full time wonderful job with a great company out of KC, and I. I um, have, I was offered two book contracts. I haven't even talked to you about that. No. Um, and I turned one down um, and kind of staged the other one, which happens to be a beer book, but more on a national level about German breweries and, you know, the, the best German breweries in our country. But I, I keep wrestling with how do I make the time? you know, um, as I take care of our family and, you know, put money in the bank as well, my wife you does. Have, so, you have to take care of your readers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll do it, you know, online. Uh, but I've been challenged there too. I have a, I have a, um, I have a, you know, website and I've let it gather dust. <laughs> I've been more focused on posting on social, but that could be an avenue too in the short term where at least I could be, you know, through networking, posting, you know, for the state, you know, new breweries that are coming up and coming or the latest news, you know, Walnut River doing something different. Um, so I might go down that avenue as well. And just for everybody to know, I'm uh, planning to do, uh, we can easily do 15 more minutes of questions and conversation. Then we'll throw it open to if you all have questions or want to interact with Michael. Is that all right with everybody? Mm -hmm. um, Everybody's still awake, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, Michael, this is a book about beer, the brewing process, and the craft brewery phenomenon. But it is, in my opinion, so much more. It's about business and entrepreneurs, life in small town Kansas, hopes, dreams, and revitalization and preservation. And you've mentioned some of those as, as we've talked, but I found in the book several ongoing themes. And one of those was people returning to their hometowns. Why is that? In your conversations, could you come up with why that's important to these people? You know, I, I think in many cases, pandemic made us all kind of look inwards you know, and kind of question where we are. Um, so I've seen, um, I can name, I can think of three breweries and owners that have wanted to go back to, uh, um, you know, simpler is not the right word, but just a, a better quality of life, you know? So I've seen that and that equates to coming home. 
Um, you know, I, I think, and I think pandemic did a lot of shaping of that. Um, you know, but in some cases, well, actually, the you know, I, I haven't really touched on age demographics, but the thing that I have found so encouraging is um, the majority of the small breweries that have opened in the smaller towns are younger couples without children. Yeah. You know, so that is also really exciting because they obviously are going to have more of an influence if they're, you know, all of a sudden having a family and, and you know, adding to the wealth of that community. Um, but I think there was a lot of and wealth reflection. beyond wealth beyond economic. Yes, yes, absolutely. I think there was a lot of reflection on you know what was important, and I definitely sense that in a lot of conversations. Well, of course, the pandemic was a game changer for many of us, the country, and yeah. it really was. You know, another ongoing theme was which I really enjoyed was. Uh, the repurposing of these older buildings in these communities. Yeah. You know, we've talked about their old mercantile stores, old uh, skating rinks, stables, uh, gas stations, gas stations, filling station and garage, fabric store, uh, the Odd Fellows building. Talk about that a little bit. And what does that mean to these communities to have those buildings brought back to life? I'll use Council Grove as an example. I met with uh, uh, the woman who's the lead for economic development in that county as kind of an aside after I met with the brewery team. And one of the brewers happens to be on the Council Grove economic development team as well. So he's committed or they're committed. But she talked about, and I can't, I could try to visualize, visualize it. I didn't see it. She really talked about the dramatic shifts in Council Grove in a main street that was predominantly empty buildings. You know, uh, uh, you know, paper in the windows, some buildings tumbling down where the shell was still there, and how much that town has moved from empty buildings to, I think, one building that's not being purposed right now. Um, the, couple that, the couples that bought the building they put the brewery in had lots of surprises. You know, they're on a riverbank. So they had to go deep, you know, with concrete, make sure that that building wasn't going to go anywhere. Let's so, just talk about that building. Yeah. Excuse me yeah. for interrupting, but talking about the Riverbank Brewing Company, this is from page 89. <laughs> uh, the building that had started as a livery stable evolved through the next 100 years as a skating rink, bowling alley, and armory. Yeah. The structure sat empty for close to 30 years. Yeah. And now it's come back to life, as you and I know. Yeah. Um, and it seems to me that that is Kansas connecting in a positive way with its history. Do you agree with that? Totally. I mean, I, I think of another brewery down in Pittsburgh, Drop the Age Brewing. And the <laughs> fascinating thing with that brewery, back in the day, um, an executive from Ford Motor Company back in 1910-20 was at odds with... Uh, Mr. Ford and management, and he broke loose and started his own automotive company, Durant Motors. Somebody didn't get along with him and, before. Yeah, <laughs> and, and his show mode. I mean, it's so cool. You walk into this beautiful building that the couple, uh, yeah. Mark and Kathy, have protected um, you know, with these arch windows. And I find sometimes when I go in, I'm like, I sit at the table, I'm like, I wonder what Durant car, you know, years ago was sitting right here, you know. Um, the the guys at Sylvan Grove, you know, they have the restaurant on the main floor. It used to be an elevator, and there was a showroom, and they were taking cars up to the second floor. So some of the stories of these buildings are priceless. Um, in many cases, in Holton, the Wilcott family opened Wilcott Brewing, and Sean did most. Well, he did a lot of the work, and. He talks about when he and his wife were standing, basically, he had gutted the entire inside of the building, protected the walls, but he's standing with rain coming down on his head, you know, looking at this space going, is this really going to happen? But um, talk about commitment, yeah. you know, and perseverance um, to make it happen. And his story is great because they've got a brewery in that building. They've got a great corner brewery in Holton beautiful building again he restored and protected and now they've opened a, another location in Leavenworth 
you know, so it, again, you see these stories where it's like, okay. Well, there's yeah. another theme here that you and I have talked about, and uh, you know, people coming home and repurposing of buildings. But it was intriguing to me that people either leaving or having an addition to their lifelong work. I mean, you've got doctors and lawyers, accountants, uh, many different professionals going into the brewing industry. Uh, you want to talk about that? When what was your sense of busy well, with these people? Why? No surprise. I mean, a lot of them were passionate about home brewing, you know, and started winning awards. Um, you know, I, I can think of two firemen, you know, one in KCK, who's a fireman EMT, and he opened up Range 23 in a tiny town called Piper, Kansas, just outside of KCK. And he's growing. And he's getting recognized for making really good beer. You'd have to pull up and he had a drive through window because they didn't have a tap room. But he and his wife, God bless them, were you know making beer and his daughters were making uh, soda. Um, but I think a lot of it comes back to, I think of um, Clint in, uh, with 1524 in Clay Center. Um, home brewer, good at it, started putting his beer into competitions, was winning. Um, and in many cases, they were being challenged by friends, you know, have you thought about opening a brewery? Um, so a lot of that kind of groundswell, um, I think has influenced a lot of these people that come from different backgrounds. Um, you know, the two firefighters are still firefighters. Um, Andy Brewer works down at Independence. Um, Robert is a firefighter for Coffee Bill. You know, so often you also are seeing these folks that the breweries might not be open six days a week. Or they might be open Thursdays through Sundays so they can you know, do what, um, what they do, whether it's law, surgeon in Wichita with um, uh, what beautiful. It's like an English pub I'm trying to remember. Oh, yeah. Help me. Uh, I'm blocking. Yeah. But I know the one you're talking yeah. about. Here, please. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, your surgeon and, you know, I mean, it's just, it's amazing. And you think about Tom and sitting with him, he and his, his partner just had a passion for brewing. And often you see people that guys like a uh, central standard, you know, these guys got so good at brewing. Then they said, well, let's start making really good pizza. Put a pizza oven outside one of their houses. So all of a sudden, you know, the gatherings were not 10. They were 20 and 30. And in that case, I think it was Andy Boyd came up with his own beer label. You know, so they were canning beer with their own, you know, beer label back in the day before they went commercial. But you're obviously talking about committed, interesting, creative people who are looking for a quality of life or to do something that makes a difference to them and in their community, which I think is part of the fabulous part of the story. Um you wrote, Michael, that the last feature story, It's a Small Town Sticking Around, is the most important story that you wrote. Why is that? Uh, you know, that story was the one I procrastinated. I'm sure we all remember being in school and you kept putting something aside. And that story to me, that's a story about the six breweries that I kind of highlight in that story that all open in communities of under 2,500 people, either in 20. Uh, 21 or spilled into 2022. I wrote about some breweries that weren't open yet, you know, and in some cases went back after the book was published to finally see the brewery open. But I was driving between destinations, had my country uh, station on and Toby Keith came on and I was thinking about these small towns. He's got a, a song called It's a Small Town Sticking Around. And I'm like, oh my God, Toby's talking to me. That, <laughs> I, you know, that's what I'm seeing. So I, you know, I, I felt that was the most important story, you know, where I, I had a responsibility, you know, and, and um, I didn't approach this cavalierly, but like, I, I need to get that story right, you know, so it weaves in those breweries. I talk about Marcy Penner, the Kansas Sampler Foundation. Um, and, you know, to me, it just really, because I've seen it with what's opening in 2023, it's not going away. You know, I think if there's movement and you'll hear from some of our bigger brewers in the state, regional breweries are kind of almost a thing of the past. 
they're just too difficult to open up. So the brewery growth in our state is going to be more of these small breweries. You know, they could be tap rooms or they could be five barrel, 10 barrel houses in smaller communities where, you know, and uh, Lawrence Beer Co. is a great one. They're in East Lawrence. They are not concerned. They don't let, they, they aren't selling their beer to wholesale. You know, their aim is that they want to see the neighbors walking down in East Lawrence to have a beer, have a meal, and that's who they're catering to. You know, they are not, you know, you can buy a growler and go home, but you can't find their beer in a grocery store. And they don't plan on doing that because they truly view their mission as being a neighborhood brewery. You know, and I, I think that's, you know, that's that's what's happening. And I think that's an underlying theme for all this. A uh, couple more questions, Michael. Uh, do you quote Corey Johnston of the Fields and Ivory Brewery in Lawrence as saying, Kansas has long been the breadbasket of America, and we think it can be the beer barrel too. Uh, <laughs> do you agree with that? It, I mean, there's a lot of work to do. You know, you reference malting companies, for example. I mean, Corey um, has 670 acres that he doesn't farm, but he owns that are farm where he generates his summer wheat is barley, which is a very fickle um, weed, but you know, I think he's grown it seven years running and had three years where he could actually use the barley. It was quality enough to, to put into his Kansas lager. Um, but here he's, um, you know, getting those crops and he has to put the crops in the truck and send them down to Texas to get malted. And he's adamant, you know, that, that he wants to do, play his role and his part. He was in DC actually doing some lobbying with brewers from around the country. Um, so in the state of Kansas, you know, he, you know, a vision of his is we need to see a malting company, you know, breakthrough in our state. Um, Kansas Hop Co., the first hop farm, um, you know, two guys that now have a brewery called Tall Trellis. They opened up a three acre hop farm in Ottawa, Kansas on parents' land. And um, they have found uh, varieties that can grow in the Kansas climate, um, and they tend to be more of the dominant varieties, and they're feeding those to Midwestern breweries and almost all the Kansas breweries. So, you know, we're seeing more of that movement where it's almost like we could become more self-sufficient, but we've got a long way to go. Um, it's a challenge. I know. But I think we've got some people like Corey and others that want to make it happen. Now I have to ask, did the first annual Fresh Hop Festival in the fall of 2022 then occur? At Tall Trellis? Yeah. It did not. <laughs> um, but I know it's going to happen this year. And the reason it did not, they started, they had such an outpouring of support with their brewery. And they started with a two-barrel brew system. And they could not keep up. So what what they did initially was they have 16 taps. All 16 taps initially were breweries from the state of Kansas that they were feeding hops to. So they were supporting them. Um, and they scaled as quickly as they could. They put, if you if you make a road trip, stop at Tall Trellis in Olathe, because on the grounds, they actually planted hop vines. Um, and as they mature, you know, on the patio, you can go out and sit on picnic tables in between the, the hop vines. Uh, and their, you know, their aim obviously is to have a wet hop harvest at their location. They played a significant role uh, with a lot of breweries around the state with their hops as um, last fall uh, brewing wet hop, wet hop beer. <clears throat> so they're not there yet, but they know they're going to be there. We like to, uh, I think Michael and I both enjoy this next set of questions. And Benjamin Franklin is alleged to have said that God made beer because he loves us and wants us to be happy. <laughs> do you agree that beer is on a heavenly plane? <laughs> you know, I, I do. You know, and, and I actually, you'll see a quote in the book from Abe. You know, the people can be depended upon, upon to meet any national crisis. The great point is to bring them the real facts and beer. I swear Abraham said that. But, you know, th there were beer fans back in the day. And, you know, I think it's less about the beer. It's more about the experience, you know, hanging with friends and family, you know, and having great conversations. Beer to me quickly became a backdrop. You know, I don't write for, true, you know, like beer nerds that want 
you know, to read a book that talks about what was on tap, you know, the 12 taps in Blind Tiger the day I was there. Those taps, you know, have a seasonal evolution. So it's really less about, I might talk about flagship beers and beers that are just so iconic for some of these breweries, but I try to get more into, you know, what motivates you as a brewer? Where's your come from? Um, there's a brewer at Pathlight Brewing in Shawnee that's got synesthesia, where when he smells things, he things he sees color. So he builds his recipes cool. via color. He is a microbiologist who is now very happily a full time brewer, and he's been recognized as the top one of the top brewers in the KC area. But he, I mean, you sit with him if you go there, ask for Tanner Vaughn. He'll come out in his Carhartt overalls. And he'll be happy to have a pint with you and you get him going. And it's fascinating. You know, you know one of the things that, that I noted was the, you touched upon it, was the originality in brewery names and in the, the names of their various crews that they're touring. You know, and I would, because of your book, was Friendly Bassett, or what's the Happy Bassett? Happy Bassett, Happy Bassett Pika. And you were just amazed at the variety of, of names that they had on tap. It's a challenge for them. Because, I mean, whether they're trying to find new names for beer styles or names for breweries, just from a trademark standpoint, Manhattan Brewing, you know, that name was owned by a gentleman who is now a um, the head brewer and I think owner of Brooklyn Brewing in Brooklyn, New York. Mm. And they had to go through some machinations to make sure that they were okay using the name Manhattan Brewing. Okay. So um, you'll hear them kind of, you know, Remember when it was easy and they could just, you know, grab a song from Steve Miller Band and go, Fly Like an Eagle's our, our beer name. And now they have to be a little bit more thoughtful so they don't get in trouble. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to turn it over to yeah. the audience, uh, either uh, at Zoom or here at the library. Uh, and uh, as you can probably tell Michael and I could. All, all yeah. <laughs> yeah, please. Uh, those of you on, on Zoom and on the Facebook chat, I'm looking at both so you can uh, type your questions. And um, we do already have one on Zoom from um, Joey Young, who I will say is the publisher of the Harvey County Now. Um, so he's touching on something I think we're all aware of, which is that there is there is not a brewery in Newton. Um, yeah. <laughs> so he asks, is Newton slash Harvey County the most populated area to not have a local brewery? <laughs> and what do these smaller breweries work in your opinion? I think you talked about some of yeah. those ones. No, I, I was amazed when I realized population of Newton and kind of went, there's not a brewery in Newton. Yeah. There are a couple destinations, you know, like um, I'm not saying Junction City is on the same level, but there are still some baffling cases where there are communities that don't have breweries that could easily support a brewery or perhaps in the case of Newton, you know, could there be two someday, you know, a brewery restaurant or tap room. Um, I think the special mojo is um, finding someone, you know, you should be looking at everybody that's left Newton and start reaching out to them and say, come on back. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, it's good fortunes. It's someone like, you know, you who loves doing what you do with your church for great <laughs> not to put pressure on you, but, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take someone like that, I think, that either drives through and goes, I love this community, or is from here. Um, you know, I, I think what I have seen in some of the smaller communities is the communities also have made it much easier for these people to open up with dispensations, you know, I'll sell the building to you for a dollar you know, that type of thing, because they're so, uh, they're a little bit, they're, they're really aggressive on wanting to drive economic development. And they're, they're bending somewhat some of these communities to make it easier for a couple or people that are entertaining opening a business to consider it. Um, and I, I've seen that as well. When Michael and I were visiting about this presentation, because I knew that there wasn't a Newton brewery in the book, and I just really assumed that something had happened. So I asked Michael about it just to verify there wasn't. I'm really surprised. Yeah. I think Church Brew Club sounds like a great name for a place here in New York. You're like, why did I talk to this thing? <laughs> Yeah. Well, I didn't know I was going to be the focal point. Are, are any of these breweries run by churches? 
You know, I mean, there are churches that run coffee shops. So why not true. worry? So <laughs> true. you never know. I think of a great coffee shop uh, in um, Pace that I love that you know, is, is uh, incredible. For, you, know. you never know. I think it, it takes the good fortune of having the right people. And I don't know enough about the community, but there's a great coffee house here, dorms, yeah, and yeah. bookstores. So there's yeah, yeah. yeah. you've got twenty thousand people. It's a vital community. Yeah. So I'm, I'm I am surprised. And no, I don't want to open a brewery. <laughs> Kansas. Kansas had yeah has various ethnic groups throughout. I'm just curious if in any of those communities, like the Bulga Germans or the Czechs, or I don't know if there's an Irish settlement, whether they've if any of those communities have attempted to duplicate something from like the Volga Germans, a German well, beer, or the Czechs, some like a Pilsner or something yeah, like that? Great question. I would love it because I love a great German beer or a Czech beer. <laughs> um, a, a brewer from Sand Hills, which has two locations, Hayes and Mission, um, the, the brothers, Jonathan and Pippin, very happily supported he breaking off he hasn't opened in the state of kansas but he's opened in parkville missouri just north of kc and he's opened up german style and that's his whole focus german and czech um i would love to see that um we really don't have anybody that's gone you know that culturally to culturally to celebrate you know heritage and bring it forward um you know, the closest brewery I can speak of, and it's certainly not answering your question, is Blind Tiger with John Dean, who's the most awarded brewer in the state of Kansas. Um, he really has a, a desire to brew good German beer, uh, but I wouldn't call him a German brewer. Good question. Uh, I, I hinted at this before, and, and you mentioned Fields and Ivy growing some of their own grain, the sadness that it has to be shipped out to be bolted. Um, it's also said that that lager is it's fine, but it's kind of boring. Um, I wonder what to you what what's what's the most Kansan beer made in Kansas? Oh, I have not been asked that question. That's before. a great question. That's a really good question. Most Kansas Kansan beer in Kansas. Have you had any of the Kernza beer? I have. That would be pretty Kansas. Yes. yes. Um, well, field, uh, field, no, no, LBC and Free State made a, made a run at um, Brewing Currents of Beer last year. I know in McPherson, um, Three Rigs actually it was the first time I tasted a beer where they were trying to use the currents of grain. Um, and that is, I mean, that's encouraging because that obviously is going to really uh, be a positive on our, on our environment and farming if, if the currents of grain can get to the point where it can be commercial. You know, that's a great question. Um, I would say, you, you, can I think, is it, I, you know, there are a few brewers that have kind of laid claim to wanting to do as much as they can with Kansas ingredients. Um, so let me, I'm going to answer that. It's, it's a tough one. Yeah, it's a really tough one. That's the first time I've been asked that. That's a great question. Knew he was the sleeper in the bed. You said the Wichita scene was kind of the best in Kansas. Can you talk about that? You know what I love about the Wichita beer scene? A lot of them have grown through um, um, the second oldest brewery in the state, and it's escaping me, uh, River, City. River City. So there's a tree that's brewing tree that's grown out of River City. You know, you think about Dan Norton who came from River City. He then opened up Norton's. He, he mentored Matt, who just opened up Tor Brewing. So what I find in this community is they're really tight. That's one thing that rubs me the wrong way in Lawrence, and I love my town, but there's very little collaboration. There's, you know, there's a, a spirit that at times isn't real healthy. There's a brewery that happened to open across the street from Free State. You know, and, and that caused some <laughs> angst in our community. But when I look at Wichita, yeah, when I, when, I, when I look at Wichita, I mean, I've been down here and gone to Central Standard, you know, and seen brewers be bopping over, you know, Tory from 
Hopping Gnome. I mean, he'll be over there. I've been in Hopping Gnome where I've seen uh, Cody Sherwood, who's doing all the brewing at Wichita, sitting at the counter. Um, there's a there's a collaboration, a genuine collaboration, and I think there's a friendship, and a lot of it has to do with a lot of them have kind of grown up knowing each other, and then they've they've grown. Um, and I love like you know Dan Norton can be very intimidating looking. You know, I expect him to get off a of Harley Hog. You know, he's just got that. He can, he can have a mean look about it, but he's he is a softy. When I sat with him, he talked about how much that place meant to him and how much it meant to to mentor Matt. And I saw tears like across it. I'm like, wait a minute, you know, uh, I didn't give that hard a time because I don't know him that well. But you know, um, there's something here. There's a there's a really cool fraternity. And then you know, Walnut River, great example. Walnut River, Travis of Walnut River helped the two women in Winfield find the brewing equipment for their brewery. He and the Walnut River team got the equipment, brought it down to Winfield. He also helped the women with their business plan. So, you know, I think what I see is there's a sphere where the more breweries, the better. Where, you know, yeah, there's competition, but they they don't view it that way right away. You know, and I've heard, you know, um, that principles that all those breweries talking about wanting Wichita to be a Fort Collins, you know, wanting Wichita to be a beer scene that people, you know, will travel to, um, you know, you can have a great weekend if you want to just enjoy, you know, Wichita and, and experience some of the great breweries here. I think that's the big difference. But to me, you know, Wichita way was how I led, you know, here I'm from Lawrence and, I think Lawrence and that section might be my second. I was really, I felt that the Wichita way, just, I called it the Wichita way. Um, there's just some really good mojo. You know, I've, I've fallen in love. I'll come down here, you know, with my wife to have an afternoon or an evening because I want to come down and see, you know, the team at Central Standard or, you know, see what's happening with Tori and Stacy with their new development, the construction that's, doing really well at Hopping No, where they're going to open up all that space. Let's follow up a little bit. And I know we're running, I know. Oh, we've got, we still got some time. Okay. Yeah. Talking about Wichita uh, and <clears throat> particularly, do you see the possibility of the market actually becoming oversaturated with craft breweries? You know, uh, take it beyond Wichita, but just generally speaking. I don't, if, if, I, I don't see, I mean, I agree with the the comments I've heard from principals that the regional breweries are really hard. That growth is gone. That's going to be much more of a flat business. We've got one brewer in the state with, that would love to be a regional brewery, and that's Kansas Territory. Um, but the growth really is, I mean, we've got so many communities you know, New yeah. Junction City, <laughs> um, you know, that, that could easily have, I mean, easy, that's easy for me to say, but there's there's room and I think there's a community. Well, so, again, we've got, yeah, we've got so, markets where there isn't anything, but yeah, I'm focusing but on Wichita. Wichita, you, you talk to the Wichita guys and gals, they say there's more room. Really? You know, I think you've got to think about, you know, Wichita Brewing, they've got the restaurants, their pizza, I mean, they've got the bigger platform. Um, you know, those like Tori and Stacy, they went down the avenue of opening a tap room and it was economically a better fit for them financially as a couple, less risky initially. Um, and I love tap rooms because it really feels like you're walking into a neighborhood bar. I mean, you can just, it's, it's a different feel than a full blown restaurant. So I think the, there's that room as far as deciding kind of what scale you want to open up. Um, now, they might say if all of a sudden there are 17 breweries in the Wichita area, it might be a different story. But I heard as I was writing from all the breweries that, yeah, we have more room. West is what I heard. Yeah, Go west. Yeah, there would be a lot of growth in that area. Of course, again, it's all, we all view things from our own particular perspective. Yep. But... You know, you've talked about one of the things that comes out in the book and in our conversations that these locations, whether it's a small brewery or just a tap room, or, that it's really a place for social gathering. I mean, it's much more than going a place to go 
have two or three beers. It's much more than that. You know what I what I love. I met Ted. Uh, it's called Books and Brew. So uh, Flint Hills Books and Council Grove started partnering with Riverbank. Uh, I can't remember what Tuesday of the month. Once a month, they do a combined event. And, you know, they've got people gathering that might hear Jennifer talk about, you know, all the new fall releases, or mm -hmm. I was very fortunate to be invited down to talk about my book. So what I see happening, you know, you see book events, uh, Farm and Odd Fellows has had at least one wedding, you know, um, um, Transport Brewing, um, I hear and I see on their social posts, I mean, they'll have families coming in celebrating a one-year-old birthday. But it's a chance for, you know, maybe mom and dad to sneak as grandparents take care of that one year old and have a beer. But I think the beauty is it's um, it, it's a place to be, yeah. you know, and, and a lot of these folks are creating that opportunity. And then, you know, all of a sudden, Farm and Odd Fellows, if you haven't been, it's beautiful. Um, there are chandeliers in their brew house. <laughs> I laid on the ground in the brew house, just taking photos, going, okay, this is one of a kind. But um, it's like a 1920s throwback when you walk into this, this beautiful space. So a lot of these people have created beautiful space, you know, and people are drawn to that one to just hang, but two, all of a sudden, you know, um, you know, pre-wedding dinners. I mean, you're seeing a lot of things happen because the community wants to go. Well, again, social yeah, gathering. Absolutely. And, and I love libraries and I love bookstores. So I have to put in a plug for Flint Hills Books and Council Grove. Uh, Jennifer Katzbaum, I practiced law with Jennifer for a number of years. And she has it's a beautiful space. It's an historic old bank building. And she's done a great job of selection of books that people want to read. And so it's a, it's a beautiful space. Yeah. I would encourage people to go there. I agree. I've spent some money there. <laughs> well, to do. I really thank you to me. Oh, yes. I still have to answer your question. Yes. Oh, my, my question is kind of like putting ketchup on steak, probably. How many of these uh, breweries also produce root beer? You know, more and more. Um, what I find is the breweries that have children, it's an automatic because the children are like, I want to play a part in it. Um, and they're making good root beer. Um, but I still would say it's probably less than a third of the breweries. Um, but I, but that, that to me was the immediate like common denominator where, you know, range 23, um, you know, their daughters run around because they want to be near dad. And now they have, a, you know, they're canning sodas and root beers. And I think you're also seeing uh, uh, Courtney Service Service Brewing. Her son wanted to be part of the business, and they created a uh, soda line using his name that you can buy cans and take home. So a lot of it's because of children, parents wanting children to be part of it, children kind of pushing, going, you know, you're asking me, uh, Farm and Odd Fellows, I mean, the the two boys were like, you know, mom and dad, you're hanging out here all the time. What do we do? You know, so it is encouraging to see that. I like a really good root beer, but I'd say it's still probably less than a third of the brewers that are making really good root beer. Good question. Just so you know, I'm sure that Michael will be happy to sign uh, a book for you or if you have one or if you have some for sale. Yep, I do. Yep, I'd be happy to. Anything... We've got one more. Oh, okay. Uh, this should probably be the last last question. Um, Joey asked, um, can you speak to the economic benefits of a brewery opening in a community? <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, traffic. You know, I think Council Grove, um, you know, all of a sudden they're pulling not only their community. Um, you know, a great example, I'll confess. I stopped at Walnut River down in El Dorado on the way here because they just posted they've got a new wheat beer. I was disappointed the Wayward Sun wasn't out yet. But I sat and had a uh, war beer. And I was just kind of listening to the crowd. I was an outsider. You know, it's a Tuesday and their tap room was packed. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> um, but there were Wayward Sons, so to speak, that were coming through. There was a businessman on his way from... Um, uh, Salina down to Wichita, 
And he happened to see the beer sign as he was driving through the intersection and quickly did a U-turn and said, I'm stopping here. So, um, you know, I, I, um, I see a lot of that where traffic, you bring in people that might not have come to the community. Um, events and collaboration, Council Grove, great example. The retailers are connecting and doing things in a broader way. Portland. Um, you know, they play a part in the town celebration every year. And what's happening is other people that might want to open in the Cortland are seeing success and all of a sudden seeing some storefronts go from being completely dark to lights on. And it gives them a little bit more courage to consider an investment in that community as well. So I, I think it's, you know, it's just bringing more people into the community. Um, it's giving people who might be thinking of opening a business the confidence. Um, bankers, I mean, the ripple effect, all of a sudden bankers might be looking at it and say, Oh, well, it's great for the carpenters and the people. Oh, yeah, the plumbers. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, there is a ripple effect for sure um, in a pretty broad way. That to me is sustainable and also lasting. You know, it's not, you know, putting a shingle up and six months later it's gone. You know, I, I think blood, sweat, and tears are going into it. And I think that's where, you know, Joey's asking, I think that's where that investment is going to have payback. Great. Well, thank you both so much. Thank you. Um, thank you. That was the question I've been asked. I've got to give oh, him an answer. Okay. You're going to keep thinking about it. Huh? Yeah. No, it, it's, I've tasted a lot of beer on this journey. So <laughs> I'm trying to think. I think probably the closest thing I've had to a true Kansas beer is a blind tiger. Um, John Dean. Um, you know, it, you, you'll see every brewer when it comes to hop season relying on people like, um, hop, um, uh, you know, the Ottawa game. Um, and there are more hop farms in our state now. There's, you know, one out near Dodge City. So there are more hop farms growing. Um, so I always see the brewers kind of going, oh, it's time to do a Kansas beer because of the hop harvest. Um, but whether it's, if, have you had the summer pasture at Phil's Ivy? Their wheat? Yes. You like it? Yeah. Yeah. So there he's using his, his wheat, you know. So, um, but I would say probably, and I can't name the style, but John has made a concerted effort to try to bring as much as he can into a couple of styles. Um, and I've made a point of going and, and trying them. I do agree. I'm intrigued by the currents of beers. I wasn't blown away. I didn't go home with a growler. It's hard to work with. Yeah, that's what I hear. Yeah, it's a really tough brain. It's small. I mean, yeah, as a brewer, I think you've got a yeah. blood, sweat, and tears. You know better than I. I haven't worked with them. I, I like what Pippin's doing at Sand Hill, yep. at harvesting Sand Hill plums by hand and making yep. something and I, very I, local. And unique. So there's a great call. Yeah. Pippin, um, those two are amazing. You know, just their story, their names, their family, <laughs> and, you know, why they opened it up, up, up in the two locations. I favor the Hutchison location. Um, more so the mission. So, you know, uh, kudos to Pippin. But I love what they do too because they celebrate, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm a fan of birds. So I, I love going in and, you know, do I get the Junko or do I get the. That was cool. Yeah. I mean, so that's a good call. I think you went up there. I think that's a good one. No, I think that's great. That's great. We need more. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. I'll make myself available if anybody wants.